Um, I work with these opportunities. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm going to talk <laughs> Hi everyone. We're going to get started oh, okay. now. Nice. Very cool. We started yeah. our yeah. online yeah. broadcast, so everyone can actually hear you at the moment. Oh, I'm starting. Yeah, we're starting. That's okay. If everyone would like to get up and get some more snacks during the presentation, please do. The snacks are courtesy of Steve. I just want to clarify, they are not on behalf of the people of Ontario. They're from, they're from Steve. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us here today. I wanted to start by giving gratitude and respect for the traditional custodians of the lands on which we live and work today. We're coming to you from Toronto, for those of you who are online. So right now we're on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We know that Toronto has been the home to Indigenous people for over 15,000 years, which blows me away every time I say it. And today Toronto is still home to some of the largest communities of Indigenous people in the country. So that's something for us to be really proud of. I hope that we can all take some time to learn about the traditional people of the land where we live and work. I know that it's not always obvious, so if you actually don't know where you are, you can download an app in the App Store. It's called Whose Land. It's actually really easy to use. Wherever you are, you open the app, it tells you which traditional territory you're on and tells you a little bit about the people who live there. So as an eighth generation settler in Canada, I am personally extremely grateful for the prosperity that my family has enjoyed here for generations. And I'm very grateful to live and work on this territory in this community. And I know that I can say the same on behalf of all of us. OTF is very happy to be partnering with the OPS Pride on another really great event. And we're happy to be hosting this particular event in Pride Month and also in Indigenous History Month. We're really happy to welcome Marie Lang, who is joining us once again. Marie joined us a few months ago and she's kindly agreed to come back and share her insights with us. Marie is a queer Mohawk scholar of mixed Haudenosaunee and Irish, Scottish, South African settler ancestry. Her family comes from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and she belongs to the Turtle Clan. Marie holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sexual Diversity Studies from the University of Toronto and a Master of Arts in Social Justice Education from Boise. Her research centers on the experience of young trans, two-spirit and queer Indigenous people and the ways in which they understand the term and the identity two-spirit. So please join me in welcoming Marie and enjoy. Oh yeah, it's on, amazing. Um, hi everyone, um, thanks everyone so much for coming. Um, I'll introduce myself in my language real quick. Um, so, Sego, 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 Marie Yungets, Kanyukahaga, Ni Wagawanjaru, Waget Nyada, Ni Wagitalora, Aswigo, Ni Wagenu. So, um, yeah, what I just said in Ganigeha, so in uh, my Mohawk language, which I'm very, very, very much still learning, is my name's Marie, I'm Mohawk, uh, my family comes from Oshwigan, which is Six Nations at the Grand River Territory, and I belong to the Turtle Clan. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be here um, once again. Um, and I'm gonna be presenting today about my master's thesis research. Um, my thesis title was Conversations with Young Trans, Queer, and Two-Spirit Indigenous People about the term Two-Spirit. But today I'm not only gonna be talking about what participants told me about, you know, how they understand the term Two-Spirit, but I'm also gonna be talking about the research process and how participants redirected it towards uh, a standpoint that was more useful for them um, and actually more ethical for me as a researcher as well. One of the main ideas that I'll be sharing, um, or most of the main ideas that I'll be sharing, kind of are about contradictions and complexities. So even though I will be explaining a little bit about how the folks who I talked to 
use and understand the term two-spirit, I'm also going to be reiterating their position that it's not all that important for non-two-spirit folks to know exactly what the word two-spirit means. And we'll unpack that a little bit as we go. Um, and I will leave a lot of time for questions and discussion at the end. So hold on to them, hold on to them. Um, so a little quick note on terminology. The title of my presentation today is actually Two-Spirit Queer and Trans Indigenous Youth in Toronto Refusing the Question, What Does Two-Spirit Mean? Uh, and I use the phrase trans, queer, and two-spirit Indigenous people with you know varying word order kind of throughout. Instead of using two-spirit as an umbrella term, for all Indigenous LGBTQI folks. And I do that because not all of the research participants who, with whom I spoke, uh, and certainly not all LGBTQI plus Indigenous folks use the term Two-Spirit to self-identify. Um, and I actually you know, don't uh, use the term Two-Spirit to describe myself. Um, so that's just kind of my way of, obviously there are still problems with queer and trans and umbrella terms, and we could be here all day, all day talking about that, but my little, um, little piece about, you know, not using two-spirit as, as an umbrella term in an uncritical way. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, in order to talk at all about the term two-spirit, we of course have to talk about where the term came from. Um, and that's a 1990 gathering um, that was the actual third international gathering of American Indian and First Nation gays and lesbians. Now it's just known as the International Two-Spirit Gathering. Um, but that was a gathering of LGBTQI plus indigenous folks that was held just outside of Winnipeg uh, in 1990. And the term Two-Spirit was um, brought to the gathering by a Cree community member, scholar, and now an elder named Myra Laramie. Um, and the term to spirit, um, when she uh, kind of brought it forward, was an, um, kind of a, a bit of a way to, you know, have, have a bit of that uh, umbrella, so covering um, the, the real shared experiences of colonization and also resilience that are shared among our diverse nations, you know, from coast to coast to coast to coast here on Turtle Island, um, but also as a term that can speak to the specific and really nuanced experiences of being someone who has a complex sexuality or complex gender within our, our individual nations. So me as a queer Mohawk person, my experience of my gender and my sexuality within that Ongwehongwe context, within that Haudenosaunee context, is gonna be different from someone who's a queer Inuk, right? It's gonna be different from some, from like a, uh, like a trans Cree person who's from Saskatchewan. All of, all of these, um, all of our experiences are different, but Two-Spirit was coined as a word that can speak to those differences and kind of hold that space. Uh, and so, as uh, as you know, the years have gone on in the almost thirty years now uh, since the term was coined. It's been used more and more frequently in reference to uh, LGBTQI Indigenous folks, um, and it means a lot of different things uh, to a lot of different people. But what's funny about the term two-spirit, um, and one of the reasons why I actually wanted to engage in this research for my master's, was that it's a word that simultaneously gets used as an umbrella term, so a, an umbrella term that really broadly speaks to a lot of different experiences, um, but also it's frequently used with the specific and really literal uh, understanding that it means uh, someone who has a male and a female spirit. Uh, and that, like in some traditions, is 100% the truth um, and is, is a way that people understand and use the term. And, and that is 100% valid for them. And it is uh, important to recognize that that's one meaning that the term has. But one of the things that I was seeing as I was uh, you know, coming into my graduate studies and also just as a community member is a lot of times that one particular definition of two-spirit um, gets taken up and gets shared really broadly in a way that elides the, uh, or kind of obscures the other uh, really 
uh, a large number of definitions uh, and and meanings that people do um, ascribe to the term. So I, I was seeing a lot of you know mainstream LGBTQ uh, organizations having you know definitions on their glossaries on their website that would say two spirit is uh, a lot of the times it's this language about um, you know two spirit people were revered. Uh, shamans who had a male and female spirit, and they were uh, and they were honored as special people within the First Nations culture. Um, and there's a lot of things wrong with that sentence, not least of which is is the singular culture, right? Because all of our nations are so different, and all of our peoples are so different. Um, but you know, there's uh, yeah, there was this kind of homogenizing narrative that I wanted to intervene in, um, and so that's one of the reasons that I. Um, began this research is I wanted to create, you know, a scholarly citable document that could, uh, you know, have the voices of community members speaking about how Two Spirit means a lot of different things. That, you know, whenever uh, Joe, what's his face from uh, whatever mainstream LGBTQ organization is looking on the internet for research so he can make his little paragraph about Two Spirit things and check off the reconciliation box, he can. Uh, actually have some voices of community members um, in a source that's like, citable in that kind of way. Um, and so that's what brought me to the research. And the research itself uh, was a qualitative interview project. I spoke to 10 fellow queer, uh, trans, and two-spirit identified young people. Um, everyone was indigenous. Everyone lived in Toronto. Folks were between the ages of 18 and 35. Um, spoke to folks, uh, mostly uh, pretty short interviews, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, thereabouts. Um, and another part of the uh, research methods that I really wanted to include was uh, concept mapping. So a lot of folks uh, know concept maps as either word webs or mind maps. Is anyone, is anyone familiar? Can I get a show of hands? Had, has anyone heard that term? Yeah, like concept maps, word webs. I learned it in like sixth grade when we were making a little word web about something or other in English class. So um, it's just a way, uh, I, I, I use it as a, as a way to have a, a kind of visual representation of ideas that um, is a, you know, a, a more a more kind way of uh, allowing folks to communicate visually instead of just this, uh, uh, you know, talking uh, kind of method of, of the interviews. So folks who are better visual communicators would have that option. And I was, yeah, really encouraged by my uh, mentor uh, and thesis supervisor, Dr. Eve Tuck, to do that um, in order to, because we're talking about a really complex subject, have that type of um, kind of accessibility component as well. I uh, recruited participants through the snowball method, so mostly just um, through community contacts, got my first uh, seed participants, and then they forwarded other folks uh, to me. Um, and uh, for the concept maps, uh, lots of folks kind of uh, took it in different directions. One example uh, of a concept map that I'll uh, show really briefly before kind of getting into the core themes that emerged from the research. Um, is this one right here, and this, this uh, concept map was made by a participant whose pseudonym, because um, everyone got to pick a pseudonym, uh, pseudonym was Fenris, uh, and so this participant uh, really highlights the relationship between two-spirit as a term, the loss and theft of identity, reclaiming identity and community, and bridging gaps between other nations and communities and their similar experiences. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, simple concept map. There was ones that were more complicated, but this is just one example. And it brings up one of the um, key points that came up in my interview with uh, this participant was the idea that two-spirit is a word that can, uh, as they say, bridge gaps between nations and communities in the way, in kind of in the same way that, that the term was, was coined to do. Um, and it's also a word that allows us to um, not uh, not build on, uh, a, a, not have an idea of a deficit model. They were really clear when they were telling me about uh, this loss and theft of identity that they were, um, that Two-Spirit for them is a placeholder. It's a placeholder term, right? And so they're actively working to relearn their um, uh, 
both of their indigenous languages and to find a word that can ex express who they are and their complexities of gender and sexuality. Um, and they're, uh, they're doing that through building on the resilience of their community, of their two-sphere community and the broader indigenous community, um, kind of in the face of this deliberate theft of uh, our, our ways uh, and our languages. Um, but it's not to say that, um, that they're looking at it from a deficit model, which is um, an important point there. Um, and that kind of brings me to um, another uh, participant's concept map, very different concept map. Obviously this participant um, just kind of felt like drawing all of these dancing Thunderbirds and so that's what they did. Um, but the reason that I, uh, I'm gonna bring up this participant is because it was um, this participant who, in conversation with them, made me really think differently about the research project, what I was actually doing. Um, the original research question that I brought to participants was, how do you understand the term two-spirit? And I chose that question because of, you know, its utility in the original political project of the work, which was, you know, creating this citable scholarly document with the thoughts and the words of uh, community members that could be used to intervene in this singular, literal definition of two-spirit that proliferates. Um, and that political project reflects a theory of change that I am no longer invested in. Uh, over the course of the research, the theory of change that I, you know, that underpins the work shifted in response to ways that um, participants like this one, whose pseudonym, you'll see the little emoji in the corner, that's actually the pseudonym that they picked. Um, and so like uh, this participant, I, I just call them hard eyes. So conversations with participants like hard eyes, uh, uh, a lot of them, a lot of the participants were enacting refusal in our conversations. And when I talk about refusal, I'm using it in the, uh, in the way that uh, Ganawage-based uh, anthropologist Audra Simpson uses refusal. She termed, uh, she coined the term ethnographic refusal um, in her uh, 2014 book Mohawk Interruptus, um, and she kind of uh, defines ethnographic refusal as a practice or a position that's taken both by researchers and by communities that is animated by two things. Number one, uh, placing limitations on what you are or are not going to talk about in, in research. So placing the limits on what knowledge the academy gets to access. And uh, number two, a redirection of the research process by participants. And so participants in my research um, really did a lot of those redirections. Because um, when I initially conceptualized um, this research, the theory of change that I was working with was a really typical, classic social science research approach um, that uh, was essentially, it was the idea was to represent, you know, the authentic voices of uh, these dispossessed peoples, in this case, my peers, in order to bring to light um, the inequalities uh, that kind of structure our oppression uh, and then therefore be able to begin the process of redress. Um, and I was, you know, again, seeking to do that through having this citable resource of uh, folks talking about how two spirit means all of these different things in order to challenge that narrow and homogenizing uh, kind of one note definition of the term that gets circulated a lot. But during the research interviews, um, participants really steered our conversations away from creating a definition of two-spirit for that kind of external audience. Uh, and they redirected our conversations towards what they wanted to talk about, you know, in our own communities. They wanted to talk about the political significance of two-spirit as a term. They wanted to talk about their experiences in ceremony. They wanted to talk about um, their languages, they wanted to talk about how they're building community with other folks in Toronto and, um, and online as well. Um, so it was through these types of redirections that I came to understand that the ways in which cisgender heterosexual people understand the word to spirit is not actually the biggest concern for participants. Instead, folks were really focused on um, the ways that 
their communities were building livable futures together. Um, and that refusal was really a refusal of that theory of change that's endemic in academic research. Because that theory of change, um, kind of the academy's theory of change, broadly speaking, um, is to remedy issues of social inequality through the development of uh, knowledge, mostly like white settler folks' knowledge of, of you know, the other, right? Of folks who are marginalized. And then once, uh, once the people in power uh, know that what they're doing is wrong, um, then they'll change, then things will get better. Uh, and that theory of change really locates power in uh, mostly white, cishet uh, men, for the most part. And the theory of change that was actually offered to me by, by participants um, was one that locates power within our own communities. Uh, and what participants said really clearly to me, and Heart Eyes in particular, was uh, change doesn't happen when white people know better. Change happens when we, as trans, two-spirited, queer, indigenous people, are able to come together um, and have conversations and build community among ourselves because we're the agents of change and we're already making the changes that we need uh, in order to survive in this in this wacky, wild world that we're in right now. Um, and so, um, kind of in these conversations, what people brought up a lot was. Um, the fact that doing this educational work about two spirit, um, what it what it does and doesn't mean, is something that it's. I mean, it's not a way that folks really wanted to spend their time, but it was something that they were asked to do really frequently. Um, it's something that we're expected to do on a pretty much a daily basis, and sometimes that means that participants were, you know, asked by people what exactly they mean when they say they're two spirit. Um, other times. Uh, Particular, particularly a lot of trans participants uh, got, uh, you know, and continue to get a lot of invasive questions about their genders and about their bodies. Um, and, you know, sometimes people are asked, like, yeah, who do you sleep with? Like the really, the really like on the nose type of questions. Um, it, and that's one form of, of this educational labor that, that people are, are forced to do. Uh, and another type is when people just make assumptions and don't ask the invasive questions, but instead make really invasive assumptions about people's bodies and about people's lives. Um, and one, uh, one story that a participant shared with me um, that particularly kind of illustrates this point. Um, this participant's pseudonym is Nathan, and I know this is a really wordy slide, and you're not supposed to put this much text on the slide, but I'll read it to you, so don't even bother looking at it. Um, so Nathan said to me, I feel that, that we were talking about um, using two-spirit as a word to signal um, uh, being non-binary. And so they said, I feel that more within the queer indigenous community, that we see each other using it in a way that claims space for complex forms of gender. The broader indigenous community, I don't feel like people have gotten the memo yet. In the times that I've used it as a way to signal to indigenous folks that I'm non-binary, which to me is blatantly obvious based on how I present myself, it always surprises me how much I need to really help people recognize that in me too. But I've never had great results using Two-Spirit. If I'm interacting with someone from the community, a cishet indigenous person from the community, and I say that I identify as two-spirit, they don't know that that would impact my pronouns. They assume that I'm a lesbian, I'm pretty sure like 97% of the time. So as much as internally I feel like there's more recognition, I feel like that's not true in the outside world. And so here, uh, Nathan is uh, getting at how you know, because Two-Spirit is frequently misunderstood as a term that only references someone's sexuality and not someone's gender identity, um, they often have to, you know, really explain details about their gender and about their life to counter that kind of eraser, erasure um, and be understood. And so given, given this type of, of reality, given the fact that, you know, people, are, people do make a lot of harmful assumptions um, based on the, a narrow understanding of the word two-spirit that does harm to our community members. Part of the work, um, part, of, part of the work of this research and myself as a researcher is, um, is kind of that which I originally had intended, right? Is to do that type of a little bit of uh, harm reduction work um, in offering the understandings of two-spirit held by participants to expand conversations 
uh, beyond a literal kind of uh, limiting definition of the word. Uh, and that is, you know, part of my research uh, responsibility is to have those outward facing conversations um, and do some of that educational work so that it frees up space for other folks to have those inward facing conversations. Um, and so given that uh, even though <laughs> uh, the kind of broad theory of change of my research is that, you know, change is it predicated on non-two-spirit folks knowing what's happening? Um, some of some of my work is is still that that educational piece, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what participants uh, said about two-spirit as a term. Most of uh, most of our conversations that I had with participants were. Um, really clear that two-spirit means a lot of different things to many different people. One of my friends actually um, explains it like uh, if there were a hundred two-spirit people in a room, there would be a hundred definitions of two-spirit as a term in that room as well, right? Uh, so two-spirit can mean something uh, related to someone's gender. It can be a term that describes your sexuality. For other people, it's a term that describes the roles and responsibilities they take up in ceremony and in their communities. And it can it and means many, many other things to other people as well. Um, so not just a gay indigenous person. Um, and uh, one of the things that one participant in particular really kind of brought home to me was um, the idea that instead of thinking about two-spirit as an umbrella term, we can think of it as instead a bit of a container. Um, because like I said before, not everyone who's LGBTQ and Indigenous uses the term two-spirit. Um, And so it's a bit, it's it's a little bit dangerous to to use it as as an umbrella term like that, um, just because I mean one person has been in particular. She was talking about her home community, her home reserve, and she said that when she was you know speaking to some um, some other young people there, kind of about uh, about being two spirit and about being LGBTQ. Um, the other young people from her home community were like, well, we don't really use the term two-spirit here. That's like, that's a really Toronto thing. Like that's an urban thing. We're just like, we're just gay. We're just gay and native. Uh, and, uh, and so it really does differ from place to place. Um, but thinking about it kind of as a container, kind of instead of an umbrella, I think gives it a bit more, a bit more emphasis on, on the different ways that people do imbue the term with meaning. Right, um, and another thing, as I've as I've said a few times, was um, this idea that non two spirit folks don't necessarily need to understand what two spirit means, um, because you know, I mean, we don't need to know exactly what someone uh, means when they say they're queer in order to not make assumptions about you know who their uh, partners are or who. Um, who they're sleeping with, right? We don't need to know exactly what you mean when you say you're two-spirit in order to not make assumptions about what pronouns you use or not make assumptions about your gender or, or what body parts you do or don't have, right? Um, so a lot of what folks were telling me was, um, was the need to kind of, um, yeah, have a, have a better understanding of the fact that two-spirit means a lot of things in order to get people to stop making those harmful assumptions. Um, and the, uh, coming back to this idea of two-spirit meaning a lot of different things to different folks, um, this is a quote by Fenris, that participant who made that first concept map that we saw. Um, and Fenris said to me, um, for me, two-spirit speaks specifically to my gender identity. To me, it doesn't really reference my queerness. I identify as queer also in my attraction, my relationships with people, that's queer. But that to me isn't anywhere near as related to two-spiritness as my gender. I feel like the way that I experience my gender is inherently indigenous because I'm indigenous and I can't really separate my identities that way. Also just because of who I am. But I don't feel like someone who is a cis gay man and is also two-spirit is any less two-spirit just because the way that I view two-spirit really centers in on gender. Um, so what Fenris and what a lot of participants said was this idea that um, 
like there's a lot of concurrent truths um, that can exist, uh, you know, at the, at the same time, right? So two spirit um, for some people means uh, uh, means something about their sexuality, and for other people it means something about their gender, and for other people it means something different, and all of those things get to be true at the same time, um, which is uh, kind of um, well, in English that's like it's a uh, English isn't a language that. Uh, that really lends itself to, to multiple truths being uh, being possible, um, whereas our indigenous languages are really uh, have more more space in those ways. Um, and uh, you know, on the note of uh, two spirit meaning a lot of different things, this is a really small and kind of pixelated concept map here. But this one was uh, by a participant named Doug. Uh, and for Doug, two spirit is really connected not just to sexuality and gender, but a, a lot of a lot of different aspects of life, right? So politics, reclaiming sexual traditions, culture, language, land, um, indigeneity, making your family uncomfortable. All of those things were really related to the term two spirit for this participant. Um, and. Uh, you know, as, as participants were redirecting um, our conversations towards what was important to them, a lot of folks did talk about the limits of the English language in describing complexities of gender and sexuality, um, and just the, the failure of English to even be able to describe our indigenous ways of being in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that um, folks kind of zeroed in on was, um, again going back to that idea shared by Fenris on their concept map in the very beginning of of loss and theft of identity uh, because language um, was really one of the um, one of the things that um, that was stolen from our communities that has had a really big impact on our ability to um, talk about gender and sexuality um, because as I'm sure um, folks know um, I mean, the residential school system, not only was it a really, really uh, binary gender system that was enforced there, that is, um, for the most part, very different from our indigenous ways of understanding gender. Um, and again, those our, our traditional understandings of gender differ from people to people and from nation to nation and territory to territory. But for the most part, um, you know, even when, um, and myself as a Haudenosaunee person, our system of gender is pretty binary, but it's not uh, its not a, a violent binary in the same kind of way that um, that the white Western gender binary exists, right? It's there. Uh, they're just very different ways of understanding the world. And those ways of understanding the world um, are held within our languages. Uh, and our languages, again, in residential schools were one of the things that was purposefully taken away in order to um, yeah, in order to uh, disrupt um, the continuity of culture and to try to assimilate us um, in order to, yeah, in order to facilitate the, that genocide. Um, and so because of the ways that um, language has been uh, lost and stolen in a lot of communities, our ways of talking about gender and sexuality and complexities and diversities in within those realms um, is something that a lot of people are working to rebuild and we're working really hard to rebuild that. So um, some folks um, are, uh, some participants were really interested in finding words in their indigenous languages to describe, you know, their gender and their sexuality. Um, and some folks um, were not really interested in, you know, kind of learning pre-contact words um, that describe gender and sexuality complexity. Because um, there is uh, a lot of times for um, two-spirit folks, people really zero in on this question of what <laughs> what were two-spirit people up to before contact? Like what what were what were y'all looking like? Um, <laughs> and that that question comes from a number of different places. Um, and I'll actually talk uh, about. Uh, I'll talk about it in the context of something that another thing that Fenris said, um, and they said that um, they were t they were talking about um, kind of broad indigenous communities um, trying to include two spirit people, 
Um, and they said, what they envision is seeking out these really rigid definitions and all the time referencing us to like, oh, we can't have existed if we don't have really direct records of what we were in the past. And not very much, if any, kind of recognition for what we are now, what we're doing now, how we're living now, and what we need now. Uh, and so these types of, these types of, you know, um, focusing on uh, this, these kind of authenticity narratives of what, what was happening in the past is, is what l l gives our lives in the present any type of, of credence or credulity. Um, those, those narratives come from a couple of different places. Number one, I think that a lot of folks, I mean, I myself certainly, um, really want to know about what um, queer and trans and two-spirit Haudenosaunee people were doing before contact and what my ancestors looked like in order to know myself and in order to, yeah, just kind of for my own heart and my spirit. Um, and other people, um, sometimes it is really necessary or not necessary, but it's a really useful thing to be able to, you know, when um, your homophobic grandma is coming at you to be able to say, well, actually, uh, you know, our, uh, our in the longhouse, you know, we would we would have allowed um, like all kinds of partnerships to happen, right? Like we there's these like facts that you can lay out when you're kind of fighting that homophobia and transphobia in community, um, and and the historical record is a really useful tool to do that. And so that's one reason that that type of um, you know searching for that authentication happens. Um, but another reason is colonialism, right? Because uh, uh, the colonial uh, imaginary really likes to think of indigenous people as only existing in the past. Like we don't, like I'm wearing a cotton shirt and jeans and like Oxfords right now, like <laughs> the, the colonial imagination wants me in buckskin 500 years ago is, is where they want us, right? Um, and that's actually enshrined in, in, in the Canadian law, like the legal test for whether or not um, our, <laughs> uh, our practices are protected as, a, as an Aboriginal right is whether or not we were doing those practices at the moment of contact. It's like literally the moment of contact. The first time one of my ancestors saw a white person who came off a boat, like whatever they were doing at that moment and in that historical moment are what is considered, you know, um, cultural practices to which we have an, an alienable right. Um, and so those types of authenticity narratives are really, really strong and are being used in a lot of different capacities. And that's how it's kind of, that's how I've seen it kind of come into um, conversations about two spirit and this real thirst for knowledge about what, like, what our lives looked like pre-contact, um, and so you'll, as you see here, a lot of uh, young people are pushing back against that and saying, well, uh, you know, uh, you know, our a lot of. <laughs> A lot of our traditions are post-contact traditions, right? Beadwork, um, you know, like powwows, um, all kinds of things are post-contract traditions. Um, and so when, um, you know, that's that's one kind of way of, of complicating those conversations. Um, but also just asserting that, you know, we're here right now and regardless of whether or not Regardless of whether or not you know there would have been space for me as like a butch dyke in the longhouse 600 years ago, I'm here right now and I need space right now. And so that's what we need to be dealing with. And so that's um, that was another key point that folks really um, really focused on. Uh, and that idea of claiming space was uh, was a through line for for lots of folks. Here's uh, Hard Eyes who made that Dancing Thunderbirds concept map, and they said. I think when we talk about what gifts do two-spirit people bring to community, what are our roles, what are our teachings, I think that's one of the biggest ones that I've seen and been taught by community here, is that we are change bringers, that we bring change into everywhere we go, and that's exhausting. Um, and so uh, what, a lot of, what a lot of folks um, talked about was, again, so this is speaking to that educational labor piece of being expected to explain to spirit, um, but it's also about, um, you know, just our presence in spaces being something that forces, um, forces change to happen. Um, but also um, how that is uh, a practice that can wear you out really, really quickly. Um, and this links back to, you know, uh, that 
the problem of uh, cis sexism, right? That those assumptions that we saw again at the beginning, that participant Nathan's story about saying that um, the two spirit and then people assuming that that means that they're a cis gay person. And a lot of participants really um, shared that it was, it's that, that assumption that when you say I'm two spirit, what you're saying is, oh, hi, I'm a cis gay native person. <coughs> that, that assumption is, is one that causes a large amount of harm and a large amount of, um, of, of friction in, in their lives and in community spaces in particular. Um, and it's the root of, yeah, it's the root of a lot of, of the lateral violence that people are experiencing, both within two spirit communities and in, um, in broader indigenous communities and in LGBTQ communities and like on the subway, like cis sexism, yeah, is is a, an enormous issue. Um, and so, um, <coughs> one of the uh, another one of the kind of through lines that kind of um, went through a lot of different people's stories that they told me was. Um, was the idea that two spirit was a term with a history and a long future. So this is a participant named Sam. Um, <coughs> Sam said, for a while I didn't use two spirit. And then I realized it was really powerful to use that word because it's a word that we can connect on. It's why lots of words have been made to use that way. Even queer and trans communities, people organize around terms so that they can come together. And we haven't always had that opportunity and that's part of the history of that word, right? Uh, and so here Sam was talking about um, the idea that two-spirit was specifically coined as a term that could, as a, as a banner under which we could organize politically as queer, trans, uh, indigenous people. Um, and so that's part of where that power of the word comes from, is, is from, you know, making a word that we can use together in order to carve out that space for one another, in order to, uh, yeah, do some of that space claiming work that hard eyes was also talking about. Um, and that is, that's one of the big differences that people, um, that people mentioned about Two-Spirit, um, a difference between Two-Spirit and the other uh, LGBTQ alphabet soup terms. This is another quote by Sam, uh, and they said, Two-Spirit means so many things, and it doesn't work the same way as some of these other words that we have like Western notions of sexuality and gender. It's like when people say woman, they're expecting a certain thing. When you say man, they're expecting a certain thing. And you can't do that with two-spirit. People do that with the word, but I actually don't think that's how it should work ever. Um, and so um, this is kind of in, uh, in kind of winding down and wrapping up, tying the threads together. This is um, going back to that idea that um, you don't really need to know what two-spirit means in order to not make cis-sexist assumptions about someone, right? Um, and uh, one of the participants, uh, who's a friend of mine, the way that they um, phrased it is two-spirit's supposed to be confusing. It's, it's, a, it's like a, there's, there's, that's something that it shares with the term queer. Like it's supposed to be a little bit like, what do you mean? Like, I don't get it. And then it's like, yes, you don't get it. That's the point. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of that, right? Um, which I'm sure folks folks get. Um, and it's in some cases, people really do use two spirit in order to kind of enact a different kind of refusal. It's a, a refusal of that educational labor when people are like, "So, how do you have sex?" They're like, "No, I'm not gonna. No, that's not what this conversation is about." Uh, and 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 two spirit is one of one of the words that people use in order to kind of do that refusal. Um, so again, uh, people use it in so many different ways, not only in, in the ways that it means different things, but also the actual deployment of the term um, really uh, is quite diverse among, among the folks with whom I spoke. And kind of uh, going back to what, what Sam had said, um, it's important. One of the one of the ways that folks really um, kind of felt that two spirit was meaningful was as a word that people can connect on, um, right? And it's a word that folks are using in order to uh, organize and to make some of that community building happen, to make those changes happen that um, 
that everyone told me are are happening already in our communities and that that's where change is, is happening. Um, so now what I'm doing essentially with this research is, you know, because participants uh, and their refusals and redirections really shifted how I was approaching it, um, I'm kind of doing two things because I, you know, I'm not, um, I'm no longer thinking of the project as, as like an amplifier of trans, two-spirit, and queer indigenous youth voices um, in order to, you know, impact uh, those, uh, the people who we think are, are the ones who, who hold all the power. Um, instead, um, not, not instead as well, it's also, um, it's also a, a vehicle to share um, the knowledge and desires and needs and, and ideas of participants with other two-spirit, queer, and trans indigenous youth. Uh, and so um, I'm trying to both disseminate the research in a broad context like this one, um, and I'm also, you know, I, I made a zine version of my thesis to uh, share with community members and um, kind of to make the, the ideas that participants shared with me accessible um, to other young people in order to facilitate some of those, those conversations that are, you know, um, the inward facing ones that participants said were really meaningful uh, to them. And that is pretty much uh, all I have to say for right now, and we can open up to questions, comments. I'm going to drink a lot of water right now because my throat is killing me. <laughs> yes, totally. So 10 doesn't seem like a lot. Are you interested in doing more? Totally. Um, thank you for that question. I definitely am interested in expanding these conversations. Um, originally, my thesis supervisor came at me with a, with a number between 35 and 40, and I was like, ma'am, this is a master's thesis. Like, let's have a minute here. Um, but yes, definitely, I'd be interested in, in ex expanding um, for, um, yeah, and, and definitely um, looking at not just in Toronto, that would be that would be what I would want to do is to talk to folks kind of in different places because folks' experiences do differ so much from place to place. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Touch on a little bit, but I'm curious to know what your experience was like navigating academia in, in this project. <laughs> Totally, amazing question, thank you. So the question is, what was my experience navigating academia during this project? Um, and uh, my experience was uh, pretty unusual, I think, for most indigenous scholars, is that it was, it was great. <laughs> it was uh, relatively painless. Um, which is uh, for a couple of reasons. So the one of the one of the um, ways in which I walk in the world is someone who's white coated. Like if you look at me on the street, you probably think I'm just a white person. Um, and uh, that uh, having white skin and having that privilege has really impacted the ways in which I move through the educational system. Um, so um, yeah, teachers um, taught me as someone who they would assume who they thought was going to go to university and, and university, they were like, yeah, you're going to go to grad school and all of those type of institutional racism things um, were something that I, I benefited from as someone with white skin um, and also someone who grew up, I grew up in Kingston, Ontario, so I didn't grow up on the reserve. So I had, you know, access to adequate fun, not, not quite adequately funded schools because I was in primary school when Harris was in. So, but <laughs> better funded schools than um, folks on reserve um, had access to. Um, and so those those things are, are some things that uh, helped make my experience of grad school good. Um, and the other really big thing was having support from a ton of amazing indigenous scholars at Boise, um, as well as my um, supervisor, um, Eve Tuck, who is a rad indigenous feminist scholar from Alaska. Um, so having that mentorship and having that um, that support network of peers were was really important. Yeah, and having the having the support of um, of folks who who, who kind of got it. Yeah, but overall it was it was good. Thank you for that question. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I learned a lot today. Thank you very much. 
Um, one of the things that I learned of the many um, are that some people's, how they interpret and feel their definition of two-spirited is tied to their cultural responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. I, I'm glad I came to this talk, otherwise I never would have assumed, and I don't want to be an assumer, but I wouldn't have thought that that's tied into gender slash sexualized term in our society. Can you talk a little more mm -hmm. about that? And is that based on pre-contact or around the time of contact gender identities of men and women from indigenous communities? Totally, yeah. So a question about, um, yeah, about two-spirit being related to um, cultural responsibilities and things like that. Um, so it, it differs from person to person. Yeah, it differs from person to person. So some folks who, um, you know, take up, um, like, responsibilities in their communities as a two-spirit person, um, some of those responsibilities would be um, uh, responsibilities of, you know, a specific gender that has been a gender identity that's traditionally existed in their community for a long time. And for other folks, taking up two-spirit responsibilities would look like taking up responsibilities that someone with their gender traditionally wouldn't take on, right? Um, and so it really does differ um, from person to person and community to community. Yeah, awesome question. Thank you. You have one from online. Ooh. So as Hard Eyes writes, bringing change is exhausting. What are the best ways that we can strengthen or support those who bring change? Awesome question. So um, bringing change is exhausting. How, how, how to support folks who are bringing that change. Um, one way is definitely um, continuing to um, to self-educate. So that's that's one way is like really taking on, like recognizing that folks are exhausted from, from doing that educational work. And so taking some of that on. So read it, like making sure like you're following lots of two-spirit people on Twitter um, and, you know, like, uh, yeah, reading um, and, and, you know, actually, you know, being, um, going out and, and, you know, participating in, you know, actions and um, being involved on in a political context, if that's something that you are able to do, um, is, is certainly something is, is really, you know, leveraging, um, leveraging your own privilege, right? And depending on where you're located socially, that's going to look different for all of us. But um, yeah, things like, I mean, uh, being, uh, yeah, being willing to, um, to show up for Indigenous communities, um, whether that looks like going to a protest, whether that looks like calling your MP, whether that looks like uh, any number of things, whether that looks like volunteering at the Name Res powwow that's happening um, instead of um, doing whatever else you're going to do with your Saturday. Um, that, those, those are all ways that, um, that you can support. And the other thing, and I mean, it's like, uh, is if you're a person who has money, um, yeah, uh, that's one resource that can certainly be reallocated, uh, uh, and and there's always um, yeah there's always land defense actions happening. There's always water defense actions that are happening that do need that type of support. So that's another way as well. Yeah, awesome question. Thank you. Yeah. Were, were any of the subjects of these individuals elders? No, good question. No, I uh, I was only speaking to other young folks. So between uh, age 18 and I think the oldest person was actually 33. Um, but that's again another like way that I would love to expand is actually, uh, I mean having <laughs> having spaces to for young people to connect with elders because um, two spirit elders there's not a ton of a ton of them around in our communities. So um, having yeah having. If, if there's a way with future research that I can make some of those spaces accessible to people, that is, that's something I'm really interested in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if the, the term two-spirit, is it used internationally or is it more focused on North America? Really good question. Um, so uh, the term two-spirit is from what I know, as, as a Turtle Islands dwelling person, um, is it really isn't taken up by folks, you know, like in Australia or Indigenous folks on other continents um, or anything like that, uh, because it was, you know, uh, framed within both 
an English speaking context, uh, number one, which is like kind of the big one because um, most indigenous folks from across the world by the numbers don't speak English as their first language. Um, but um, here on Turtle Island, um, English is kind of our shared language uh, in this particular historical moment. So, um, and because it was coined specifically to speak to, you know, like uh, First Nations and American Indian experiences, it's mostly used here. Yeah, good question, thank you. We have another one online. Yeah. Are there any good indigenous resources on this subject, like Ayana Mir Maracle's A Journey in Gender? A lot of the research I've read on the Two-Spirit Identity is written by white people. Totally. Awesome question and very true. Um, <coughs> yes, um, so Anna Miracle, um, a late great um, Two-Spirit leader and artist. Um, yeah, so her writing is definitely one um, rad uh, resource. There's a number of, so in terms of um, Actually, why am I even? Yeah, there's I have I have a couple of, of references and further reading here, but um, but there's also I mean in terms of in terms of scholarship, there's a few really rad two spirit scholars who have been writing um, for the for many years. One of whom is uh, Alex Wilson. She's Cree from Northern Manitoba, um, and another one is Poli Driscoll, who is Cherokee. Um, there's uh, as well. There's a lot of um, yeah, there's a lot of really rad two-spirit trans and queer indigenous poets writing right now. Um, so Billy Ray Belcourt is one that probably some folks have heard of. Uh, Gwen Benaway, a local um, Toronto Anishinaabe Métis poet. Um, yeah, as well, um, folks like, um, wow, I am blanking on his name right now. Brutal. Okay. Um, but there's lots of, yeah, there's also lots of, yeah, lots of folks um, working uh, in the arts. Uh, and so there's, in terms of scholarship, there's there's a lot there. And there's also um, folks who are doing community work as well. I would also recommend checking out um, uh, some resources on, there's a, a list of resources on the Native Youth Sexual Health Network website um, that um, there's a link I, there might be a link in here. There is, yeah, nativeyouthsexualhealth.com. Um, and so they're a community-based, um, I should say we because I also work with them, but a community-based youth, community youth-led organization um, focusing on sexual health um, and uh, reproductive justice in our communities and a lot of rad two-spirit resources there as well. Um, awesome question, thank you to whoever asked that. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Um, so like, to what extent should the two spirit, like the two S bit be incorporated into the Western kind of LGBTQ label? Because it feels like it's kind of doing the two spirit identity and injustice by putting it with that. Awesome question. Um, so what, to what extent should the two S be on, on the alphabet soup? Uh, and I think that I mean, one of my one of my good friends uh, says if it's going to be anywhere, it should be at the at the at the front end. Um, but also, it's you know, it's I think that inclusion of of two S within the LGBT acronym, uh, you know, it can there's there's some good things and some bad things, right? So good things, forcing people to um, like say like Two-Spirit, what is that? And then when they learn what it is, they're like, oh, they remember that indigenous people exist and that we have rights, um, which is good uh, because a lot of times people forget about that. But uh, so that's that's one good thing. Uh, but then, like you say, there is a bit of a, it's, it doesn't really, uh, because it doesn't mean the same thing as a lot of the LGBTQ terms, it doesn't really, it doesn't work the same way. So it can't really, having it in that same kind of category, having it as part of the acronym kind of, um, I think leads people to believe that it's a similar type of word that does similar types of things, which is not necessarily true. Um, and so it's it's complex. Yeah, that's a, a good question, a good conversation. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Yes. 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 Y